I were a betting man, I'd say that he probably logs six to eight hours a day playing um, one of those, you know, Fortnite or one of those uh, uh, video games where you're doing nothing but dehumanizing people by blowing their heads out. And I say, how long are we going to let, for example, and, and ignore at the federal level particularly, where they can do something about the video game industry? You know, in this manifesto that we believe is from the shooter, this manifesto, he talks about living out his super soldier fantasy on Call of Duty. Another step says the president stopped the glorification of violence through things like video games. But most researchers say there's very little evidence to show that video games actually lead to violent behavior. But, but the idea of these video games to dehumanize individuals, to um, have a game of shooting individuals and others, I've always felt that is a problem for um, future generations and others. When you look at these photos of how it took place, um, you, you can see the actions within video games and others. We must stop the glorification of violence in our society. This includes the gruesome and grisly video games that are now commonplace. You heard it, ladies and gentlemen, straight from our nation's top authority figures. This video game causes mass shootings. Fortnite, you know, the, the game where you build little bases and where you have plunger guns and ninjas and banana costumes and Wild West cowboy fights is the cause of all the gun violence and mass shootings and probably terrorism and diabetes as well. We don't need to worry about gun control, mental health care reform, or even trying to understand each other and help each other in society. Just quit playing Fortnite and everything will be fine. Or maybe just video games in general. Just blame Fortnite and video games and all the shootings will stop. This is a prime example of bullshit, and I'm going to be cursing a little bit more than usual in today's video because there's no chance of it getting monetized anyway. And bullshit is something that's very unique because it's neither a lie nor the truth. Rather, it is a distraction, and the person, in order to lie, you kind of have to know what the truth is, otherwise it's a mistake. But a bullshitter just says whatever is convenient to distract people, whether they believe it or know it to be true or not, and I think that's actually more dangerous than a lie because you can't ban or restrict access to these video games like Fortnite or Call of Duty or Mortal Kombat because of the First Amendment, which gives us the right to free speech and video games are media and art and communications and it's all covered by that. You might can make it where little kids can't buy them, but you can't restrict these in any capacity. 100% of the people saying stupid things about these video games like Fortnite have never played a single game of Fortnite in their life. Probably no video games, period, and I'm not counting the Candy Crush app that's on Grandpa's oversized iPhone when he first learned about what this magic technology the internet was. Most of these people couldn't recognize Fortnite compared to any other game or point out why these games are violent other than that they've probably seen the trailers in between, you know, matches on the NFL or whatever. The people saying this have no idea what could even cause this kind of violence from a video game. So they're literally just saying this to avoid doing any real work and avoid all of the big issues until we, the American citizens, forget all about it and move on to the next big controversial thing. Blaming video games for mass shootings is about as effective as the same people who cry about high capacity magazines or cry about mental health care and then as soon as the public's forgot about the shooting they just kind of Homer Simpson into the forest, vanish into the woodwork and are never seen again. In today's video, we're going to be talking about video game violence, potential bans, mass shootings, gun control, mental health, and the really terrifying political divide that exists in our country. It's going to be offensive to almost everybody, so hold back the hate comments for just a moment. And I've done several more statistical research-based videos in the past that are very on point and have a lot of facts and figures and stuff like that. And I've linked those down below. It's a U.S. Gun Laws, which is three-part series, and one on moral panics, which includes like the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s. But today's video, I wanted to design to be more of an emotional appeal, a little bit more of an opinion and less just a hard reading stats and figures and numbers because that's that's nonsense. And to be clear with you guys, it's not a political appeal. I'm not doing pro or anti-Trump or Democratic Party or whatever in the hell is going on. This is, this is for you, the viewer at home, the guy watching this on the bus, the guy watching this between classes or in class when he should be paying much more attention, or the people just wanting to see something a little bit more intelligent before going to sleep. I want to talk about the two shooters this past weekend, not their shootings, and we're not going to be mentioning names, we're just going to call them Daytona Shooter and El Paso Shooter, and I think that this is very important to the discussion we're about to have, 
And uh, I'm going to be a little bit careful on what content I show. YouTube is very strict on sharing mass murderer manifestos, and I don't need a community strike. But I'm going to I'm going to summarize, and I'm going to show some quotes for what I can. For the El Paso shooter, this is the one that you've probably heard the most about in the news since it was likely uh, politically motivated. He was a young man that by all appearances got sucked into white supremacy ideology which eventually led to violence. He supposedly posted his manifesto on 8chan. This is not 100% verified either by the authorities or by the owner of 8chan. There is uh, some debate on whether this is real or not, but he posts this trying to explain his actions. As a part of creating this video and doing the appropriate research, I read the entire thing. Didn't make my day great, but I did it. And regardless of what you see on the news, this is basically what it really says. A very large portion of the manifesto is about replacement theory, which is sort of a alt-right or neo-Nazi or white supremacy kind of conspiracy theory about replacing whites. Many of you have heard of this. The basic gist of it is that Hollywood media encourages interracial relationships, increasing immigration, and changing social values to mix races together and essentially end the white race through interbreeding and or genocide or lead white people to depression and having less children or just having more Hispanic children. Uh, there's a quote where he says, actually, the Hispanic community was not my target until I read The Great Replacement, which is the document most of that is based on. He blames both political parties for facilitating The Great Replacement for different reasons. For the Democratic Party, it's primarily a moral one about helping minorities and also building up a really huge and loyal Spanish voting pool. And he blames the Republican Party for actually supporting immigration because of their pro-business and pro-cheap labor kind of setup. He's like, well, you know, I'll, I'll all these companies they want to make money let's just get the cheap labor in here and we'll make them happy and we'll get our donations right the man of the El Paso shooter feels that he is losing his home state of Texas to Hispanics he very frequently calls them Hispanic invaders which is a it is a it is a word that Trump has used and received a lot of criticism for uh, you can actually see it in the document here but he calls them invaders and there's a really scary section of this document about what guns he chose and why he talks about why the weapons are effective and what they're doing he even talks about how I don't have to be ashamed for you know low-hanging fruit and shooting innocent people he says I can't recreate Call of Duty and live out a fantasy and go assault a military base which is you know for people blaming video games it's really weird that the shooter says that Call of Duty is fantasy but he says I can't do that so I'm just gonna go shoot unarmed people and I'll, I'll spread my message that way there's sections in this document about race mixing and there were significant sections about eco-terrorism uh, and anti-corporatism more specifically that corporations don't have your best interest in mind and that they're over harvesting the resources and destroying our planet he wanted to make it very clear that his actions were not born of racism or hatred or the fault of the president or anything like that. He had a big section about it. And then like right after that, there was this quote, even if other non-immigrant targets would have had greater impact, I can't bring myself to kill my fellow Americans. So I'll just shoot the immigrants because they're less of people than Americans, I suppose. And by non-immigrant targets, I'm assuming he means law enforcement, corporations, stuff like that. So the short version of this is yikes, uh, a lot to unravel, not as simple as what you've seen on TV, but there is a lot in there about white supremacy propaganda, and that is the most significant part of the manifesto. If you read the whole thing yourself, it's about three to one replacement theory to other things. However, there's one line in here that is super important that I don't think anybody on the TV or news has picked up on yet, and one that really sticks out to me. It really kind of hits home and helps me understand this guy as a person. He says, my whole life, I have been preparing for a future that currently doesn't exist. This is a man who's lost hope. He has no reason for living. And keep that in mind when we talk about the next shooter and his lifestyle. The Daytona shooter could not have been more different personality-wise or ideology-wise. He left no manifesto behind. And differently, there was no clear evidence that his crimes were politically motivated. But he did have a really spicy Twitter page and kind of a sad personal life, and he was sort of the polar opposite of the other shooter in a lot of ways. If you go check out his Twitter bio, he has he, him, so uh, into the gendered stuff, anime fan, metalhead, leftist, going to hell and not coming back. His name is actually a reference to a character from Fooly Cooly, which I've seen Fooly Cooly Part 1 and I loved it. It's one of my favorite animes of all time. 
have not seen part two, have no idea of what's going on in that one. He is a self-described leftist who has supported uh, various Democratic candidates at one point, including uh, Senator Warren. He is a self-described Satanist and posts about Hail Satan, Satanism, this and that. Some of it in kind of like an edgy, silly way, like the image you're seeing here, and some of it less so. The person is also very anti-police, anti-government, anti-FBI, anti-pretty much any armed military or paramilitary force he really, really doesn't like. And most interestingly, this is a person who is a member of a porno grind metal band called Minstrel Munchies. Porno grind, as I have learned recently, is a subgenre of grindcore, which itself is a subgenre of metal, and it's uh, sexually aggressive, to say the least. I'll show some of the song names and titles here on the screen. I'm not going to read those because YouTube will send me straight down to the community strike land. But a lot of the lyrics and songs and the overall message of this genre and what they've created is one of sexual violence and deviancy, rape fantasies, kind of, kind of, kind of on the darker, more violent end of the sexual spectrum. The shooter is also known to have had a rape list during high school of women that he would like to rape, and his friends talk about being unsure if he was schizophrenic or not. Like they interviewed his friends. And they were like, oh, he was always spacey, he couldn't do this, he couldn't do that. We always wondered if he had mental health problems, so we're not really sure how he was doing. You know, it doesn't surprise us that he went and shot people. So, very different from the first guy. But if you kind of read between the lines on this one, you see the one thing they have in common. This is a man who's been circling the drain for a very long time. He clearly has mental health issues and is not getting help for it in any way. His friends and family uh, could not or would not be there to help stabilize him, and his life choices were primarily ones of angst and rage and metal and rape and Satanism and sort of edgelord stuff that became very personal and very deep. At one point, they were actually investigating to see if this man was part of the incel movement. And given all of this, I'm going to assume that he was suffering from no small amount of depression and loneliness. The other shooter is another young man who has lost all hope for his life. He has no reason to live, no reason to exist, and everything is pointless. The only two things that these people have in common, other than that they're both young and white, and they wear glasses, <laughs> uh, but lifestyle-wise, thought-wise, mentally, psychographic, ideology-wise, the only two things that they have in common is that they lost their reasons from living. These people, these were people that were spiraling downward. They were, they were falling for a long time. Nobody was there to catch them. And they got sucked into different ideologies. In the case of the Daytona shooter, the FBI said it appeared that he was exploring, exploring various violent ideologies all at the same time, shopping for them, I suppose, to see which ones suited him best. So, so keep this loss of hope in mind when I move into my uh, solution section, which is going to come after the next section, which is a very uh, one that I wanted to kind of get some basic factual statements out of the way before we started. And these are the factual statements that I base my opinions on. So uh, we got about five of these, and then we're going to move into the solutions. Uh, number one is that gun rights in the United States is a constitutional right. This cannot be modified, hardly any, without a constitutional amendment. You have the giant shall not be infringed. I'm sure somebody didn't even read this video and just wrote it in all caps about 400 times down there in the comment section. And it's super unlikely that we are going to amend the Constitution anytime in the near future, especially with our near 50-50 political divide. You need a lot of support for that. The purpose of the Second Amendment was to allow citizens to be highly armed with, at the time, whatever weapons were available, so that they can kill corrupt government officials, foreign invaders, armies, not immigrants really, or to protect themselves. The idea is that they just fought a war of tyranny against Europe, uh, well, the United Kingdom more specifically, and they were terrified that whatever government they set up would eventually fail, and they wanted a citizenry that's armed enough to overthrow the government if necessary, or repel a foreign invader if Britain invaded again, or, you know, it was the boonies, it was the wildlands, you protect yourself. 99% of the guns available today or manufactured are designed to either kill people or kill large animals. Very few guns are toys, collectibles, or truly just for sports shooting. The vast majority of guns are designed to kill, and I would say the majority of them are designed to kill people. I am a gun owner. I have several guns in my house. I purchase them based on how well I think I could kill people with them if necessary. I'm not going hunting, there are people killing weapons, and that's a right that we have in the United States, and that's a right that I enjoy. Pretending that it's for something else is completely silly. We, in the United States, have more shooting deaths and more shooting crimes than just about anywhere else in the world, except maybe some third world places, they get a little crazy. 
And this is a problem. This is a real problem. This includes mass shootings. This includes criminals, like regular crimes and robberies. This includes cops shooting people accidentally. This includes accidental discharges, suicides. A lot of gun crime in the United States compared to the rest of the world. And we uh, have that for a reason. It's pretty obvious. Access to guns, availability of guns, the, you know, anybody can get a gun. It's going to increase shootings. Duh. I mean, the overall crime rate in the United States is actually lower than it has been in a long time. It's actually low in general compared to the rest of the world but we have more gun crime because we have more guns i don't think that should be a surprise to anybody our nation is also 100 percent fucked when it comes to health care and we are double triple gangbang fucked when it comes to mental health care i guess i guess that's a little bit more of an opinion than a fact but honest to god how many of you today have insurance how many of you today have good insurance how many of you today know that if you got a rare form of cancer that your insurance would guarantee cover it and not bend you over and fuck you in the ass and say that, well, on subsection 8 of page 732 of your giant agreement that you didn't read, it's not actually covered. Not many of you can really say that. We do not have access to good health care. I pay through the fucking nose for my health care, and I get very poor coverage because it's private. If I had a PPO plan, I could pay a little more or, or something. And don't even get me started on Medicaid, Medicare. Those are barely functioning as is. We don't have access to mental health care or regular health care. Americans work super hard, and we work harder than most other nations, yet we have very low job stability and security, and we have a lot of competition, not only you know amongst other countries, but amongst ourselves. So we have a lot of stressors, and we don't have a lot of lifelines. As Americans, we can't access mental health care without huge fees if you don't have insurance. Like, it's, it's, it's expensive. A lot of insurance won't cover mental health care. They'll cover limited amounts. You'll pay up front, and then they'll rebate you as they see fit. And some of the people that I've gone to uh, have actually just completely refused insurance and said cash only. They're not going to deal with insurance co companies. On top of this, being crazy is a social stigma. It's not acceptable to have a mental problem. No matter what the little weird ass people on Tumblr that self-diagnose stuff because they want to keep adding little descriptors to think they're cool snowflakes or whatever. In general, in America, having a mental health problem is a social stigma. It's embarrassing. People are more likely to try to hide their mental health status than they are to try to seek help for it. And finally, my fifth fact that I'm basing this on is that our political divide in this country is more extreme than I have ever seen in the last 30 years. And yes, I say 30 years, I'm 32 years old, and I used to watch the news as a very, very young child. I can, uh, I can remember back to Bush senior years. My parents just always made me watch the news. And as of right now, our political divide is extreme. Both of our parties have moved further from the center. Both of them have decided to cooperate less. Both of them have branded each other as being evil. And each state is segmenting. And we are really, really pulling apart very, very hard. And this completely fucks any real progress we have at solving any real problems. So <laughs> the short version of all this factual section is that we have a serious problem in our nation. We have a disaffected and stressed out population. They can't realistically seek any form of mental health care and definitely no forms of good mental health care. On top of that, we have easy access to a large variety of powerful firearms and a political system that's kind of designed against change at the moment. This is a serious problem. We have a huge depressed population that can't get help but can buy guns and nobody wants to do anything about it. Well, no shit. What do you think is going to happen? So, in my personal opinion, in the opinion section of this video, there are three basic ways to solve this problem depending on your political orientation or what you want to do with it. And these aren't in any particular order. Well, number one and two are not. Number three, I think, is the most important one. So, number one, Access to basic health care, including mental health care services. Right now, insurance companies and Medicaid and all this, they don't cover much in the way of health care. They cover some things. We, we already talked about that. Um, but you're not likely to get good mental health care unless you're rich. And not many of us are rich. That's just how this works. You typically see uh, commentators, usually Republicans and right-leaning, but left and a little hodgepodge of people saying, right now, this isn't a gun control issue. This is an issue of mental health care. We need better mental health care in our country. We need to support our citizens and get them the mental health care they need. But the very moment you try to write a bill that subsidizes health care, reforms health care, or does anything to our mental or regular health care system, that's socialism. That, that's socialized medicine. That's Stalin. That's Mao. That's, that's one step toward the end of America and the loss of freedom and death camps. And these people would rather do anything 
then fund social health care, which I think makes them full of shit, or at least uh, intellectually dishonest. If you say mental health care is a problem, but doing anything with the government to assist mental health care is a, f a socialism or against that, then that's hypocritical. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You either need to fund mental health care or regular health care and take it seriously, or just quit bullshitting people about it. With better, cheaper, or free mental health care, depending on how you want to cut it, we could catch a lot more of these people falling through the cracks of society. This wouldn't end mass shootings. This wouldn't end shootings, and it wouldn't fix the entire nation and all of our problems. But it's just another filter that'll catch more people that are struggling. It'll catch more people that are spiraling the drain, and you can prevent more of these shootings. Never in the history of ever any of these changes that I'll recommend, or any change that anybody recommends, will end shootings. Not if we ban and get all the guns in a big pile and throw them in a volcano and smelt them down. Somebody will manufacture them at home. They'll bring them in from another country. They'll just build bombs and shit. Crazy people going to do crazy shit. But what we can do is reduce that number and make it a lot smaller. We can make the odds a lot worse and we can make ourselves feel much more comfortable. That's what all this is for. Number two, gun laws in America make no fucking sense at all. They, they just don't. And this is coming from a pro-gun, gun-owning Texan who's handled and, and firearms all his life and shot a whole variety of firearms and concealed carry and all this kind of stuff. I'm, I'm pretty pro-gun in general, but I gotta tell you, gun laws don't make any sense. Every single state has wildly different gun regulations, ranging from basically no regulation parking lot Craigslist sales to questionably constitutionally restrictive ones such as, well, looking at you, California and New York, you guys are a little bit ridiculous on that one, but Texas is called ridiculous in the other way. Today, as of like recording this video, I can pack up, I can go out and buy some semi-automatic assault rifles this afternoon, and don't you fucking neckbeard me about, I, you don't even know it's an Armalite rifle. This fucking cuck, he's never, he doesn't know the abbreviation means Armalite. There's no technical definition of an assault rifle. That's bullshit. Everybody knows exactly what an assault rifle is. If you're gonna do the Armalite thing, get the fuck out of this video. I can go buy silencers, I can go buy explosives, I can buy a lot of deadly stuff today and use it today if I want to. I went on a pro-gun podcast about two or three years ago, I think it was with Hank Strange and them, and I, I, was, I was basically playing the lefty on there, the, the gun control guy that was sort of my shtick to bounce ideas off of me. And at one point they were trying to convince me that silencers were for hearing protection that the military invented silence these are veterans by the way trying to tell me that the military invented silencers to protect their soldiers ears and i'm like really the, the military gives so much a fuck about your ears but not any of the other ridiculous safety hazards or uh interpersonal hazards or va or whatever it's nonsense silencers are to keep your weapon quiet so you can obscure your location However, anyway, to pull this to pull this back a little bit, um, I can get out most of this in Texas with no special licensing or procedures. Silences are going to take a little bit of extra time. But the overall violent crime rate in America, despite this easy access, is pretty low. And uh, honestly, most of our shooting crime is only in a couple of cities that are not doing so great at the moment. However, ease of access to powerful, barely sub-military grade weapons is a recipe for disaster. Uh, guns scale up the deadliness of any crime or any attack. It increases paranoia in cops, which leads to them shooting and pulling guns preemptively. Any sort of fist fight or knife night or whatever, you add guns to it, it just scales up the violence. Personally, as an opinion, I think it's entirely reasonable to require a licensing procedure for weapons or for some classes of weapons. And I know, I, guys, I'm aware, slippery slope, giving up rights, losing rights, slippery slope, I've, I've read every fucking article on the planet about this, I'm aware, this is my opinion. Background checks, a mental health screening by a professional before you can purchase the weapon, especially if it's free and you don't have to pay for it, like in number one would be great. And adding expiration dates for the licenses of some weapons I think could actually be a good idea. If I want to own, if I want to go buy a fucking minigun today, I should have a license for that. But that shouldn't be a lifetime license. If I buy a minigun today, and I'm sane and I'm healthy, that's not to say what's going to happen to me five years from now. My wife's going to leave me, I'm going to lose my job, I'm going to go batshit crazy, which is actually kind of likely because uh, I have some genetic problems that means that I will likely have schizophrenia by the time that I'm 40. I already hear sounds that aren't really there sometimes, and I use the dogs, whether they react or not, to know if that's actually going on. But I realize I'm on a time limit. So it doesn't seem unreasonable to me to have to pass some test 
to do some check-in to renew the license every year, two years, whatever the hell for the higher grade weapons, or you know, really any of them, but especially the, especially the rifles, so that I can continually check in and we can certify that this person is sane. On top of this, personally, I would love, I would utterly fucking, maybe even more than the rest of them, I would love to see requirements for people to actually have to train to use their weapons before purchasing them. I see this all the time in gun stores in Texas. People come in there, never fired a gun in their life, don't know shit about guns, they watch Dirty Harry, they want to buy a 44 Magnum, and they sell it to them. And you've got somebody walking around with a huge fucking pistol that can't aim it, doesn't know how much it's going to kick, and doesn't know what it's going to punch through or how to use it or anything. It's the same thing with rifles and uh, little little fake SMGs, 9mm things with freaking gigantic mags that are, that are for people that want to feel like they're in Call of Duty. Nobody has to train. No, you don't have to know anything about these guns. You don't even have to load them or, or how to shoot them or anything. I would love for there to be a new requirement for somebody to do some basic weapons training before they purchase a weapon. Not, not just some bullshit about how to check your targets, how not to sweep people and blah, 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 but how to take it apart, how to clean it, how to maintain your weapon, a little accuracy training. If you're doing rifles, and for the purpose of rifles is to kill people in a well-regulated militia, as our constitution intends, you should give them some very, very like crash course ass training on how all that works. Uh, because a lot of people buy weapons and have no idea how to use them. There's, there's so many people every year that get killed in collateral damage type shootings because of dumbass first time shooters. People that pull a gun in their house because they think there's a robber and start shooting and they're like, oh my god, my 45 caliber bullet went through a plywood wall and hit my daughter? I had no idea that could happen. We don't need that and we, we need people that are trained. On top of this, people that are trained to use weapons commit less crimes. That's like a factual thing. You can go look that up. You can look at concealed carry holder crime rates. And generally, people that have had military and other training on firearms do not commit gun crimes because they understand how fucking serious it is. That's something that I would like. I'm saying the F word more and more as this video goes on. All right, now we're moving down to point number three. And this one's going to be a long one, so buckle up. You, the person watching this video right now, you who are watching it wherever in the world, I can't tell you, it is, the burden is on you to take reasonable steps to change society. You can't change society by posting on Twitter or Facebook statuses with thought, thoughts and prayers. You actually, actually have to do something and engage in the political process. If you have listened to my video today and you've become super offended to the point where you shut your mind down and pissed off for some political reason that I didn't cite your favorite fact or that I didn't suck Donald Trump's dick or that I didn't say that we should ban every gun on the planet and that we should all just use our words to solve problems, then you are a major part of the problem. Our society is hyper-partisan right now in a way that I have never seen before in my entire life. Literally, minutes after these shootings happened, my timeline flooded with people virtually, vir vir I said virtually signaling, virtue signaling for both sides, for the pro-gun rights and the, and the stats about how the crimes aren't so bad, not those, those specific ones, but overall like aggregate United States crimes, and other people virtue signaling for banning all guns because I'm, I value life and I'm here to protect life and I want to look good on Twitter. And just a few minutes after that, it was flooded with even more bullshit about Trump supporter, shooter, Bernie supporter, shooter, if it was right wing or left wing or Antifa, if it was a racist attack, if it was a white supremacist, if it was violent Democrats were involved or whatever the hell. It took me longer to figure out what actually happened than it did to find out the political beliefs and ideologies of what each person was. I had that information before I figured out what actually happened in the shooting, what law enforcement did, who stopped it, who was a hero, what was the hell happened, is ridiculous. And you have to accept, you as a person watching this video, you have core beliefs. Uh, many of you have probably ascribed to an ideology, whether you know it or not, but you have to accept that the ideology that you ascribe to is imperfect and always will be even if it's 99% perfect and really good all the time, since we're humans and we're imperfect, we create imperfect things, we believe in imperfect things. And if whatever it is that you believed were absolutely perfect and true, the, the, the definition of that which is true, the other side would simply cease to exist. It would fade out. There would be no alternative opinions, right? And it's, it's not like whatever group you dislike wakes up in the morning and they have a big meeting under a volcano where they drink baby's blood and plot the end of America. Neither Republicans or Democrats do that. That's not what what's that's not how either of these people live their lives. These people, everybody in the political spectrum has lived a different life. They come from a different background. They've had different life experiences, different educations. They've seen different things and they've come to different conclusions about what is best for society. 
people don't just wake up hating America and wanting to destroy the world or they're like, you know what, I'm stupid and I want to be stupid forever and I never want to be right. No, that's bullshit. Everybody thinks they're right. Everybody thinks they're doing what's best. And it is no more reasonable to hate a left-leaning person for not wanting to be shot than it is to hate a right-leaning person for wanting to have reasonable protections for themselves. The amount of times that I have to hear better dead than red from lefties or better a Russian than a Democrat is fucking terrifying to me. No, really, it is absolutely fucking lutely terrifying to see that over and over again. Like, really? You would actually prefer to die, to just fucking roll over and die and kill yourself than to have any involvement with the other basically slightly center-right party in our country that's more pro-business than yours and has different ideas and stuff. You'd rather just die than protest. That's bullshit. That's ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not a fucking Republican, but I'd much rather do that than die. Or you would rather see a Russian in power than a Democrat. So you'd rather have an autocratic, violent, corrupt, and murderous government that actually rounds up gay people and kill them and crazy shit like that instead of some hippie do-gooder. You would really rather see Vladimir Putin, who is one of the wealthiest people in the world and has a murder list that I couldn't even fill my room with, than Barack Obama, the liberal professor. Really, that's, that's fucking stupid. And if you find yourself in either of these camps, better, red, better dead than red or better Russian than Democrat, you need to take a serious minute to slow down and reevaluate where you are in your life right now, man, because it's not a good place. I'm gonna let you know that right now. You, you're, doing, you're, you're circling that drain too. And on this same note, societal change comes from actually giving a shit about other people, even when it isn't the easy thing to do. If you see a friend that's slipping away, if they're losing hope in life, if they're, they're, they're spiraling out and they're getting drawn into this extremism and other kind of you know, spooky stuff, reach out to them and try to help. Be the good friend. Talk to them. Show them that there's a reason, if nothing else, if you never change the ideology or whatever the hell, just at least show them there's a reason to live so they don't turn into violent extremists. This is the kind of stuff that we learn in kindergarten about supporting your fellow man and your friends and being a good person and caring about people. And I have no idea how we've forgotten these lessons. But as Americans, we have to at the very least support each other in our own country. It'd be great if we could do the whole rest of the world too, but at the very bare minimum, we can support ourselves and we can be there when our fellow American needs help. One good friend to either of these shooters, somebody that stepped up to make them happy, to give them a reason to live, to show them a new way, to talk them out of an ideology, to get them some mental health, to do anything, could have stopped these mass shootings. These mass shootings are because you have hopeless, despondent people getting sucked into violent ideologies, and the best way to prevent that is to give them something to live for. That was literally the American strategy to defeat communism. Communism's really appealing to people that are poor and starving and desperate because it improves their situation a little bit through collectivism, but making those poor, starving, desperate people rich and having wealth and things that their own make them not want to go to communism because they don't want to give it all up. They don't want to go down. It's the same kind of way here. If you have a reason to live, you don't commit these kind of crimes. So please, the next time you see people that are circling the drain and struggling and they need help, throw them a lifeline. Reach out. Be there. Be a friend. Even if it's somebody you would otherwise despise and hate, you're still doing a good thing. Don't piss on people just because you can. And finally, at the very end of the video today, I have one extra point. It's coming a little bit out of order because I couldn't find an appropriate place to put it in and make it fit with all the other stuff. Uh, but basically, white supremacy is on the rise in the United States. I've done a few videos about this. And no matter what Tucker Carlson's dumbass says or what the news spins it as or whatever you're seeing, I promise you, neo-Nazism and white supremacy movements are growing. Even the FBI director said so just two weeks ago in front of Congress before there were any of these shootings or any accusations or anything. I'm going to go ahead and play the clip. A majority of the um, domestic terrorism uh, cases that we've investigated uh, are motivated by some version of what you might call white supremacist violence. The reason that these movements are growing is because people are losing hope in life and it's easy to blame immigrants and scapegoat them. That's, that's literally what happened in Nazi Germany, just blame the Jews. Well, now it's just blame whatever group, right? And the problem with this kind of thing is that it isn't really clear that's the end goal. It starts off simple. It starts off innocuous. It kind of, you know, you, you get into one kind of slightly extremism, one, one weird character, one funny guy, you know, and then you watch another and another and you slowly start seeping bad information into your mind. 
and then it spreads fast. And I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen to people to get sucked into kind of violent extremism. It always starts slow and easy. Just take a look at this kid. I'm going to show a clip of this kid. It's very offensive. He's going to say the N-word, so prepare yourself for that. Uh, but undoubtedly, he was encouraged by extremism, uh, probably in person and by a fair bit of stuff he saw online to do this. I'm Parker Mush, and I hate black people. They're the worst. They're stinky, and they just suck. They're just bad people. You notice over there is a box of Jordans. The favorite pair of shoes for a black man. I'm going to show you what I think of a black man. Fuck all niggers. What you also probably didn't see is that he was later arrested for trying to shoot up his school. Uh, I don't think he shot anybody. He got arrested beforehand. But this whole scenario could have been prevented by a decent support group. Calling people the N-word and shooting shoes in a box is not illegal. If he'd had one good friend there with him to say, Hey man, I'm worried about you. Hey man, can we check up? Hey man, let's do blah 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 today and just be a good friend. You could have pulled him out of all that bullshit. And I, I know this as a real honest to God fact because I've been there in real life seeing people do exactly this kind of thing, shooting targets of minorities, meeting actual Klansmen, listening to jokes about mass murders and blacks. Bro, rural Mississippi is some real shit. You should try growing up there. But growing up in that environment, I wasn't immune to it. I wasn't perfect. I was a part of all that too. I did some things that I'm not super proud of. I didn't murder anybody, mostly just stuff I said, which is super rude, but I was a part of that growing up, you know? And with the wrong support, with the wrong friend group, or just a nudge in the other direction, I could have easily turned into exactly that kid you see right there. Instead of the drifter that's sitting here making smarter YouTube videos or whatever, I could have just as easily been Brad the bitch in prison because I went and shot a black person that I didn't like because that's all I'd heard my whole life. So, <laughs> like, just like guns and shootings and everything else, you have to keep in mind that the neo-Nazi stuff and the white supremacy stuff is spreading and it's real and that fucking terrifies me and it's one of the main reasons that I'm considering purchasing weapons now because I'm afraid that that's, that's going to grow. And yeah, like guys, I know Antifa is bad and all that stuff too, but I just want to drive home the point that the whole white supremacy thing is real. Guys, that is all for this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you learned something useful somehow. Uh, if you did, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe, or buy something from one of my various sponsors. God, it feels dirty plugging a sponsor in a video like this, but it's certainly not getting monetized. Drifter out.